Hi there boys and girls, welcome to our vodcast on the advances in genetics. There are two topics in this vodcast that we will discuss. They are genetic engineering and selective breeding. As you can see, genetic engineering covers two other topics beneath it, the science of recombinant DNA and also the science of gene transfer, which is also known as gene therapy. So let's take a look and see how these things work. Now if we take a look at recombinant DNA, recombinant DNA is essentially what it sounds like. We're recombining DNA. So what truly happens in recombinant DNA is a useful segment of DNA is inserted from one organism to another organism. Now I know your textbook said from one organism to a bacterium. However, we have taken genes from spiders that make silk and put them into the DNA of goats so the goats make spider silk when they produce goat milk. Also, we've taken fluorescent color genes and placed them in the fish so this way fish can stay fluorescent to help out with underwater cleanups and so forth. So we have taken genes from one organism and placed them into other organisms other than bacteria. However, in our vodcast tonight, we will discuss how bacteria are used in recombinant DNA. Now, using recombinant DNA, we can treat certain hormonal disorders such as diabetes and dwarfism. We use recombinant DNA to produce insulin for diabetes and growth hormone for dwarfism. But what we are going to concentrate on is the use of recombinant DNA in the production of insulin for diabetics. Now here's our chart and our diagram of how recombinant DNA works. Before we get into that, first of all, you should know that diabetes is a condition where a person cannot produce enough insulin in their body. Now if you're wondering what does that mean, Insulin is a hormone that opens up your cells that allows sugar to enter the cells so this way your cells can make energy as we talked about earlier this year. So after someone eats a meal there's a lot of glucose in the blood and that glucose needs a place to go and usually it goes into the cells. So if there's no insulin being produced then that sugar then stays out in the blood. So to supplement the small amount of insulin that's already being produced some diabetics have to take insulin shots where they put insulin directly into the blood and then it gets circulated throughout the body. Now, before recombinant DNA, insulin was produced by being extracted from pigs and cattle. Since we're mammals and pigs and cattle are mammals, there was some continuity where we could use that. So they would take the insulin from those animals and then purify them and then use them for human use. However, that was an expensive endeavor. It's also cow and pig insulin, so it's not 100% match, so it didn't work the best, but it was the best that we had. With recombinant DNA, we can now program bacteria to produce human insulin and make a lot of it in a shorter period of time. Let's take a look at how this works. So here we have our diagram on recombinant DNA. So in the upper right hand corner here we have our bacterial cell and it has a DNA loop in it in addition to its DNA chromosome. Now what scientists do is they take that DNA loop and they extract it from the bacteria and then what they'll do is they'll splice a section out of it. So once that section is cut out, the gap in the DNA loop now serves as an attachment site for the human insulin gene that we want to put into the bacteria. So in step two, we take the human insulin gene and reattach it to the DNA loop. So in step three, what happens is we've now recombined the human DNA with bacterial DNA. And that's what recombinant means. We're just attaching the gene again to a strand of DNA. Once we get the DNA loop with the human insulin gene in it, we move to step four. And step four is when another bacteria cell takes up that new DNA loop with human insulin. And this bacteria is going to do one of two things that's really helpful for us. One, the bacteria is going to start to produce insulin, make that hormone, and then two, bacteria reproduce fairly quickly. We'll have one bacteria split into two, and those two bacteria, since they have identical DNA, will make insulin and those insulin making bacteria will produce four more insulin producing bacteria and then it'll go to eight bacteria, 16 bacteria, 32 bacteria, 64 bacteria and so forth. So this allows scientists to quickly make insulin also make it much cheaper than what it was when we were extracting it from pigs and cattle. The lower price and cost of production for insulin leads to a cheaper price for patients that need to purchase it. So it's a win-win for everybody. So that's recombinant DNA. Now, the second part of genetic engineering is gene transfer. And what gene transfer is, as we talked about earlier with viruses, is when we take a segment of DNA and transfer it into a cell to replace damaged DNA. And what we do is this. The first thing we do 
was we take a normal section of DNA or a gene and place it into a virus. Remember we discussed how viruses attack cells and they're cell specific. They are going to go to the cells that we want to go and their main job without being changed is to deliver DNA. So they are the perfect carriers to transfer and deliver normal DNA. So once we get the normal gene inside the virus, we then infect the patient with the virus. Once the patient is infected with the virus, the virus is going to travel throughout the body carrying the good gene that the person needs, and then the virus is going to attach itself to the cells that it's specifically targeting. Once the virus attaches itself to the cells, it's going to then insert the normal DNA into the cell. Once the normal DNA is inside of the cell, then the normal DNA will replace the bad DNA. Hopefully, what this will do is it'll help fix and replace damaged DNA to prevent or even treat certain genetic disorders such as cystic fibrosis, which is a genetic disorder that causes excess mucus buildup in the respiratory system. So there's a gene in the lung cells that turns on and produces more mucus than normal, so the lungs start to fill up with mucus. Also, we hope to treat cancer with gene therapy because cancer is a genetic disorder. What happens in cancer is that a section of your DNA turns on like a switch and then tells the cells to quickly undergo mitosis and producing non-functioning useless cells. So that's what genetic engineering is. So let's take a look at a quick video on how gene transfer works. Virus particles containing the therapeutic gene enter the liver with the bloodstream. Their target is the region where liver cells exchange matter with the blood, the small capillaries. There are large pores in the capillary walls. The liver cells are on the other side of these openings. The capillaries also contain special cells, the macrophages. Their task is to remove any foreign and harmful particles. They will try to do this also with the virus particles. That is why the outside of our virus is coated with a protein that can bind specifically to liver cells. Because of this protein, the virus will get past the macrophages and reach the liver cells more quickly. Once the virus particle binds to the liver cell, the virus's envelope merges with the liver cell's cell membrane. This allows the virus's load of therapeutic DNA to penetrate the cell. It will find a path to the cell's nucleus. The virus proteins assure that the therapeutic gene is taken into the genetic material of the liver cell. This will enable the liver cell to function once again as a healthy cell. Alright, so that was gene transfer. Hopefully that cleared things up a little bit if you were a bit confused. Now, we're going to move on to selective breeding in a moment. However, I just want to go over the differences between genetic engineering and selective breeding and an easy way to remember the difference between the two. Genetic engineering has the word gene in it. And if you think about recombinant DNA, the splicing of a gene into bacterial DNA or gene transfer where we take a gene out of normal human DNA, put it into a virus so that gene replaces a bad gene, everything has to do with a segment of DNA being put someplace else. In selective breeding, that doesn't happen. Now it's called selective breeding because there are certain traits that we like. So in selective breeding, a desired trait is selected and organisms are bred to create offspring with that desired trait. So some of the uses that we have for selective breeding are improve crops for farmers, the better the crops you have, the better sales you have, the more money you make. Also, dogs are selectively bred for particular traits. If you notice, there are a ton of different breeds of dog. Part of the reason is Humans have selected traits that they like and bred for those particular traits, creating new breeds of dog. So let's take a look at how selective breeding works for a farmer. So what we're going to do is we're going to genetically engineer a crop, a corn crop. Now, corn is a good example because you can use different traits for corn, such as big ears of corn. If people are buying corn, they usually go for the biggest ears. They don't grab the smallest ears of corn or the sweetest tasting corn. Everybody likes sweeter tasting corn. Or maybe you want to get a crop that's more disease resistant. So when hard times fall in the growing season, that crop is less susceptible to disease, thus having more crop to be harvested and then sold in the fall. Let's take a look at how selective breeding works and we will select the trait of, of corn size. 
So when farmers selectively breed for a certain type of crop, what they do is they hold on to their best ears of corn for the particular trait that they've selected. This way they have those seeds for the next year because those seeds have the DNA for that desired trait. So for example, in this crop of corn that we've planted, we're going to go for the biggest ears. So I'm going to grab the biggest ear of corn because that has the genes to produce big ears of corn. And that's the trait that I've selected to breed for. So I'll take those seeds, plant them into the ground, and the particular ear of corn that I'll choose is this one because it's the biggest ear out of the crop. Once I plant those seeds in the ground, what will happen is they'll grow into corn plants and then the corn plants will release pollen to fertilize the eggs and then they'll produce more seeds with the same genes or similar genes as this ear of corn. But hopefully the next generation will be a little bit bigger and as we can see if you take a look at the numbers of skinny ears of corn compared from season one to season two we've already reduced the amount of skinny ears of corn. So being that we want bigger ears of corn we're going to select again the largest ear out of this crop and save these seeds. And when we take these seeds and plant them, we'll get our third season. And again, as you may notice, the ears of corn are getting bigger in the next season. So we select the biggest ear of corn in season three, save those seeds, plant them, and then we have the ears of corn for season four. And throughout every growing season, the percentage of large ears of corn compared to small ears of corn are starting to decrease. So our ears of corn on average are getting bigger. Why? Because we selected corn size, we've kept those seeds, and we've bred the corn plants to produce those types of seeds. So I'm going to select this ear of corn right here. And then voila. Okay, so selective breeding is when you pick a trait that you like, and then you breed that organism to produce offsprings with that trait. All right, boys and girls, well, that concludes our vodcast for tonight. Thank you for your time.